let's let's start. Um, good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to this webinar organized by Barcelona Supercomputing Center as part of the Fusion Cut project. My name is Mary Manson, and I'm the Fusion Group leader here at Barcelona Supercomputing Center and the PI of this Fusion Cut project. The Fusion Cut project brings together um, seven um, uh, research institutions and universities in the Barcelona area um, to establish an active fusion community, community here in Catalonia and to carry out uh, R&D in key areas of fusion reactors. Um, you see here some of the topics that we are addressing. Um, among our key objectives is to establish technology transfer from partner institutions to industry, develop industrial competencies for realization of fusion energy and transfer the relevant know-how from, from the partner institutes um, to other stakeholders. It is really great to see uh, so much interest in our first event um, with more than 90 participants at the moment connected. So thank you everyone for your participation. After this very short welcome, um, I would like to give the floor next to my colleague, uh, Dr. John Farnos from Barcelona Supercomputing Center, who will chair the, the, the next, uh, next steps of this meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mary. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. So, and thank you all of you for responding uh, positively to the announcement of the talk on behalf of the Fusion Cat project. So, as Mervi uh, has introduced, my name is Juan Farnos. I am a senior project innovation and exploitation manager at the Computer Applications Science and Engineering Department, which belongs to the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. So, I am really glad to meet you and uh, hope it will be a success. But obviously, I'm here on behalf of the, of the Fusion Cat project, where uh, my role, together with uh, our colleagues, is to be in charge of creating long-term value for the project itself, but also for promoting well-established relationships with all of you, uh, industry, academia, public institutions, or other relevant stakeholders like media, for instance. No? So please don't hesitate to contact us if you have any comment, suggestion, or simply would like to know more in deep or participate in the activities that are being carried out with, within the Fusion Cat project because we are willing to collaborate with you. So, on the other hand, let me introduce and, and give a huge thank to Dr. Angel Ibarra. So, thanks again, Dr. Ibarra, to accept our invitation. Uh, as most of you are aware, Dr. Angel Ibarra is the director of the Division for Fusion Technologies at Laboratorio Nacional de Fusión, from the CMAT here in Spain, and also our Fusion Work Package Early Neutron Source Definition and Design Project Leader. As uh, most of you know, the European Fusion Roadmap has identified as a key step a high-intensity fusion-like neutron source for the qualification of materials, so the target environment needs to be similar to the one in a fusion reactor uh, in order to drive the design and the licensing of a future demonstration reactor. So at European level, this need uh, has pushed the development and brings an opportunity you know, for a neutron source based on the lithium stripping reaction. That is called Donis. That is why we are here today. So recently, as and that is very fortunate for at least for Spain, you no. Know, uh, Granada has been chosen as the reference site in the case that the facility is built here in Europe. No? So, in this presentation, no? in this talk entitled A Neutron Source for Fusion, the Downs Project, Dr. Ibarra will discuss uh, with us the project together with its present status, near future plans, opportunities, etc. So, an emphasis uh, will, be, will be devoted to opportunities, technologies required for the for the Donis construction development and all together with which kind of involvement uh, can we expect as fusion community uh, in order to take part of this. No? 
So let me again welcome you as, as uh, the PI Mervi has, has done and just inform you that if you have any question or comment that arise from the talk from Dr. Ibarra or, or you just have some uh, questions or curiosities about the Fusion Cat project itself, we have enabled a link that is placed in the chat or that it will be placed in the next coming seconds where you can address all the questions. So please uh, try not to write your questions in the chat in order not to disturb uh, Dr. Ibarra when he's talking, but we have uh, enabled this link. You can just simply put the, the code DONES and it, it is absolutely accessible to all of you. So at the end of the talk, we will open a discussion slot and we will try to address some of the questions that uh, you uh, are interested. So that's all from my part. Uh, I would like to thank you all of you again for attending this talk. For sure, new talks uh, will be will be prepared in the next coming future. Uh, uh, wondering and hoping uh, from uh, your interest also. And I would like to give the floor to Dr. Ivan. So thank you very much for your attention. And whenever you want to, to begin, uh, you are ready. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I will try to share the screen. Let's see if it works. Uh, do you see the, the screen now? Okay, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation. Uh, I am very happy to be here to explain a little bit more in detail the project. I have prepared a presentation, I mean, due to the wide uh, audience of the, of the meeting, it is not so easy to prepare a proper uh, slides. So I have prepared a presentation in which uh, I try to explain the background of the project and what is the overall situation uh, of the project. And of course, uh, later during the discussion, maybe we can go into some details that maybe could be of interest. Uh, for you or if uh, we think that this is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, we do not have enough time, we can uh, organize an additional uh, discussion at a, a, a different moment. Okay, I have split uh, the presentation in these uh, four topics. First, uh, uh, to explain a little bit in very general terms why radiation effects are so important in the fusion environment. Uh, a few words on what is the uh, European strategy to solve the issues related with radiation effects in fusion reactors. Then a little bit on what is the description of this uh, project and of course uh, a short summary on this. Okay, you know, uh, you know, I'm sure that if you have been involved in fusion for some time, do you, you know what is the overall strategy that most of the fusion programs in the world are uh, developing to uh, get a fusion reactor. This strategy is, uh, is based on an incremental uh, development in which uh, first we develop the understanding of the plasma physics, the behavior of the plasma that can be used to produce uh, a fusion. Then we have a, um, machine, a prototyping machine in which we need to check that everything is safe. We are able to control everything and to work it together. Then we need to have a prototype of the fusion reactor and then finally a fusion reactor. This is the steps that we are developing in Europe. Uh, the step in which we develop the uh, facility in which we, we check that everything is able to work together is the ITER project that you know is being built in the south of France. But it is very important to be fully aware that ITER will not produce electricity. ITER is a steel experimental machine in which we will produce fusion reactors. We will be able to produce more energy than the energy that is needed to produce the reactors, but, but we will not produce electricity. This, the next step, uh, will be that uh, it would be the production of the you know, electricity and with relatively high availability. This will be made in a project that we call demo, in which we will qualify all the components and processes that are needed in a fusion reactor. Besides this main line of work, uh, generally speaking, all the fusion programs develop 
alternative concepts, uh, different ways to produce these uh, fusion reactions, just in case the main line of work that, that you know is based in the so-called tokamaks uh, uh, has problems. We are developing alternative concepts at European level, mainly based on the so-called accelerator concept that I will not explain, but uh, uh, there is an alternative. And besides this, there are a number of techno so-called technology issues that needs to be solved that cannot be solved in the in these machines. Uh, we need to develop an uh, additional knowledge and additional technologies in an, a number of uh, different aspects. One of the key aspects that uh, uh, re re needs to be solved between the uh, uh, presently uh, facilities between ITER and the next one, that is demo, is the um, extrapolation that is needed on the radiation level. I mean, in ITER, the number of neutrons that we produce in ITER will generate uh, uh, damage uh, in the material that is linked to the number of neutrons that is uh, in, in between one to three DPAs in all the lifetime of the facility. DPA is a unit, an arbitrary unit that we, the materials people use to measure the radiation damage in the materials. DPA means displacement per atom and that means that one DPA means that uh, all the atoms of the material has been displaced from their position once. Of course, does not mean that it has been created this number of defects, because may, in many cases, these atoms that are displaced from their position uh, are stopped in an equivalent position, so nothing happens to the material. But the, this gives you an idea on the interaction of a radiation with the material. So, in the case of ITER, the end of life of the facility, in the worst case, is around 1 to 2 dPa. In the case of a fusion in, in demo or a fusion reactor, we are talking about 20 dPa per year. So, you can see that we are talking about an extrapolation of at least or close to two, two orders of magnitude. And this is one of the biggest extrapolations between uh, ITER and demo. And this is one of the key things that we need to... Uh, uh, we need to solve, and they must be solved outside of it, I would say. So, what is the, uh, how, uh, how is the interaction of radiation with, uh, the, uh, with materials? In very general terms, there are two main phenomena. This not in the case of fusion, in all, all the uh, interaction of radiation particles with the materials, there are two types of phen phenomena that can happen. First one is the production of nuclear reactions, the, what we call transmutation, due to these nuclear reactions, well, the, the, the type and number of uh, nuclear reactions that uh, can happen is a strong function of the type of particle that are uh, incident, incident in the material, the type of material we are talking about, and uh, the energy of, it, of each one of these things. But at the end, the main consequences of this is that due to the interaction of the particles with the material we will have uh, nuclear reactions that give rise to new ions inside the material we will have new ions produced uh, in in many cases mainly ma the main ions that are introduced in the material is hydrogen and helium but depending of course on the energy of the particles and the type of reactions we can have other impurities introduced in the material this is the first thing this the second type of uh, uh, primary effects of the interaction of radiation with material is what we call uh, elastic reactions and this gives rise to point defects that uh, we due to the interaction of the particle with the ions in the material, these ions are displaced from their position and they can be stopped in an equivalent position, then nothing happens, or they can be stopped in a position that is not equivalent to this one and that generates defects in the material. This primary defects is uh, what we call holes and institutions and a vacancy inside the uh, structure of the material and ion that is located in a position that is not the right one. Of course, later on, these defects, these primary defects can move around and due to this movement, they can uh, aggregate, they can uh, be the, uh, um, frozen in different positions and this gives rise to a huge 
number of different type of deep macroscopic defects in the material, like dislocations, bubbles, precipitates, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, in the case of fusion, uh, the main uh, thing that we have is these holes and institutions, and the, uh, due to the energy of the neutrons we are talking about, uh, a lot of or a significant amount of hydrogen and helium is produced in the material, and we need to take into account these effects in the materials, the presence of hydrogen and helium, and at the same time, the generation on point defects. Of course, these primary effects has consequences in the uh, materials, pro on the macroscopic materials properties. I will not go too much into the details of this, but it is obvious. If we change the microstructure of the material, uh, uh, things will happen on the uh, macroscopical properties. And in fact, it has been measured not only in the case of fusion, but in many other uh, areas in which we have radiation, it has been measured that uh, we have an increased hardening, we decrease, uh, there is a decrease of the ductility, there is a decrease of the heat conduction, uh, there is a change in the swelling, and so on and so on. Many different properties change. And then, of course, that means that we need to, when we are making the design of a component that will be in a radiation field, and this is not fusion specific, it happens everywhere, but in the case of fusion also, we need to take into account what will happen with the uh, different materials properties uh, during and after irradiation. And uh, just to give you, let's say, a few hints of, of things that are important on this area, we must take into account the change in the mechanical properties of the structural materials, and this is a key parameter. We need to, but we need to take also into account the change in the physical properties because the fact that we have a radiation field can change the corrosion behavior of the materials, the diffusion properties, the conductivity, the optical properties, all these things can change and of course as a consequence we must take into account during the, uh, in the design. We must be aware that uh, what happens due to the radiation effects in welding and joints and uh, in, uh, let's say in uh, any kind of dissimilar materials uh, uh, areas because of course these areas usually are areas with a high density of defects and as a consequence uh, radiation effects can have impact there. We need to take into account that maybe the system behaves in a different way during irradiation than uh, before irradiation. I mean if we change the physical properties that means that if a system should react to a signal and this signal changes during irradiation maybe the system will not work properly. And of course, due to the transmutation effects, of course, maybe of these components can be activated. And as a consequence, we must take into account that maybe it will be, uh, it will require remote handling and so on and so on. I mean, the key message that I want to give to you here is that due to the interaction of radiation with the materials, this, all the different efforts related with this needs to be taken into account in the design of the of the different components and as a consequence we must be able to predict or we must be able to know what are the effects of the radiation effects on the materials so just uh, uh, going back a little bit to the fusion case i will give you a couple of examples on properties that change due to the uh, uh, radiation effects and more specifically on the case of fusion. This is a very old example on uh, the swelling of the material of, of the swelling of materials and why the helium or hydrogen contents is so important. The swelling is a property that uh, measures the increase of the volume due to the interaction of the radiation with the, with the materials. And uh, you can see in this, in the figure in the right, you can see that the swelling can be a few percent. That means a lot when you are making a design of a component. And uh, um, the amount of swelling is a function of the helium, the amount of helium that you have in the material. You will usually measure the amount of helium using a ratio that we call the helium to DPA. This gives you an idea of the amount of helium compared with the amount of point defects that you have in the material. And you can see that there is a critical, in this case, there is a critical 
amount of helium that uh, promotes the swelling in the material. And this is because uh, the helium, due to the uh, in, uh, presence of the radiation also, uh, it first it is generated and second it is able to move around in the material and at the end it is frozen in the shape of bubbles the, uh, located along the dislocation lines. Of, uh, dislocation lines. Of course, that means if we have bubbles, of course, that means that the, we need volume and of course, that means that this, the, the material increases. And as you can see, this is a very old, as I told you, this is very old case. Uh, the fus fusion is close to the worst case in this type uh, of materials. Okay, I don't want to give into, uh, I don't want to go into the details. It is just to show to you that the uh, pro properties change due to the presence of radiation. There is another a very important property for that is very relevant when we are talking about the structural materials, that this is the, uh, what we call the impact properties. Uh, there is a parameter that is very important in the design of components, that is the ductile brittle transition. You know that the, uh, um, usually when we are uh, at uh, very low temperatures, it is very easy to break down a material. This is that means that it is brittle and at high temperatures usually the materials are much more ductile so that means that they are able to accommodate relevant uh, deformations. Of course when we are making the design of a component we would like to work in an area in which they are ductile because they, in that case they are able to accommodate some change in the, in the structure of the component or, or things like this. So it is very important to know where are the, the, what is the temperature in which this, uh, let's say, transition from brittle to ductile behavior happens. You can see here, for example, uh, the, uh, the gray line gives you an idea of, the, of this transition. Uh, for the case of Eurofair material, that is one of the steels that is being considered, or is the steel that is being considered to be used in most of the fusion reactors uh, nowadays. And it is, you can see, it's a very good material because it, uh, the, the transition is below uh, room temperature and it allows us to work, to build a component that is um, working in ductile regime in uh, all the cases. When we irradiate this material, this transition moves to high temperature. As you can see, it moves a few hundred degrees centigrade. It is not a small movement. It goes from minus 100 to over 100 or 150. And of course, that means that the material cannot work in this temperature range. It must be always working at temperature significantly higher uh, to this one. This effect happens you can see in these uh, in these uh, figures uh, uh, and, uh, some ideas some qualitative behavior of this this effect you can see that this the shift of this temperature is up to 200 200 uh, degrees centigrade um, as a function of the irradiation dose even in the case of uh, no uh, fusion reaction this is these experiments the ones in the left uh, part of the uh, slide are made in fission reactors. So that means that the, this behavior happens just because we have defects in the material. Uh, we do not have a very clear idea on, or we do not know uh, what is the behavior if we, if besides this, we have helium or uh, hydrogen in the material. There are some indications along the time it has been developed, uh, some experiments in which we try to guess what will be the helium effect on this. Uh, and you can see here two examples uh, on uh, what is the helium effect. Uh, this, uh, the first one, it is um, based on experiments in which we replace some of the component on, we, let's say, sorry, we impurify the, the steel with uh, boron and then uh, we, with this we generate a lot of helium due to nuclear reactions, a lot of helium inside the material. And this, the other experiment is based on results coming from a spallation source that has a very different uh, neutron spectra, but they are also equivalent. They, they also generate a lot of helium in the material. In both cases, you can see that there is an additional uh, shift of the uh, uh, ductile um, 
brittle ductite transition, additional to the one that we get with fission, that uh, this additional um, shift can be of uh, more than a few hundred uh, degrees centigrade. So uh, with the present understanding that we have today, this is uh, the, the figure in the low, lower right part of this, we have the impression that the, the, uh, if we work in a fusion reactor in which we will have helium and DPA, the shift of the uh, ductile to uh, brittle transition will be, can be of hundreds uh, of uh, degrees centigrade. The problem that we have is that, of course, these experiments are not fully relevant uh, for the fusion case because neither the beryllium dopen, neither the spallation sur are the proper um, the proper uh, experiments, they are not equivalent, fully equivalent to a fusion one. So it is mandatory to have a better knowledge of the behavioral material and to do this we need to have a, neut a neutron source that is fusion-like or fusion-like neutron source. I mean the important thing of this shift in this case is because is, is that uh, the design window that we have to use the material will be decreased. I mean, if we are, if we have a shift in the temperature of 600 degrees centigrade, that means that uh, the material cannot work below 500 degrees due to other properties. The material cannot go over 550, so this material cannot be used for uh, fusion uh, reactors if they are going to be radiated up to this high temperature. So this is why Today, in the present designs that we are making today, demo, for example, is working in this, re in this, in this range. But in, a, in, in any case, again, this model is not fully consolidated. Okay, so this gives you an explanation why this neutron source is, is needed. What is the European strategy on this topic? This is a sketch of the fusion roadmap that has been approved in 2018, I think, the European fusion roadmap. Of course, you can see that in this roadmap, the key milestone is ITER. First, we need to get results from ITER. Second, the second milestone is DEMO. We need to build DEMO to be demonstrate that we are able to produce electricity from fusion. But to be able to build DEMO, we need to know better the uh, behavior of the materials. And to do this, we need this uh, neutron source facility. and of course, a further upgrade uh, later on. When we need this data? Of course, this da data are needed to consolidate the design parameters that are being used at this moment. You know, demo is being designed today. The conceptual design of demo is being developed today. At some moment in the 20s, we will go to the preliminary engineering design phase. At some moment in the late 30s, we will go to the final engineering design phase. So we need to know these materials properties, let's say, below, uh, before the end of the preliminary engineering design phase. At some moment during the preliminary engineering design phase, we need to validate the design criteria that, that are being used. And let's say at the end of the preliminary engineering design phase, sorry, at the end of the final engineering design phase, when we go to the licensing authorities, we will need to be able to demonstrate that we know the behavior of the materials in this uh, working condition. So this is more or less the time scale in which uh, we are moving. So what is the idea at the European level to develop these materials database? It is a, a stepped approach as usual. Uh, the first uh, um, step is, or the first idea is to try to develop <clears throat> a very detailed or as much as detailed as possible uh, database of the effect of radiation, fission radiation uh, on, uh, on materials. And in fact, today uh, it is planned to spend more than 50 millions of euros of neutron irradiation of uh, this type of materials. The idea is to develop a complete database uh, with a best estimate that it is written there, a best estimate to, uh, of the um, behavior of the materials in such a way that we are able, able to develop design criteria for, for the engineering design. Then in a second step or in parallel to this, this um, database will be 
normalize or calibrate it if you want uh, with data coming from the fusion like uh, irradiations and uh, in order to do this it is mandatory to have this uh, uh, a neutron source able to qualify the, the uh, materials that we think can be used in a fusion reactor it is also very important to uh, develop uh, um, small sample te techniques to, to be able to demonstrate to, that uh, because the volume that will be available for these irradiations both in the fission reactors and in the fusion like ones is, is always limited and then that means that we must be able to demonstrate from the engineering point of view that uh, small samples can be used for this uh, for the development of this database and all this scheme is based as i mentioned before on the assumption that the fusion related efforts will start to appear at the doses in the around between 10 to 20 dpas uh, and only at higher doses than this the fusion effects will be significant okay so this is the in general so this is the overall strategy so what what is the requirements for this fusion like uh, neutron source the requirements in general terms are that the, we need to have uh, enough neutrons to allow for accelerated testing we cannot wait 20 years to get results we need to obtain the results in a few years of irradiation we mm, must be able to reach the expected operational lifetime of the materials otherwise we will not be able to get the results and we must be able to irradiate the volume large enough to allow the characterization of macroscopic properties of engineering interest uh, that these are needed uh, for them all. Uh, generally speaking, well, uh, when we translate these requirements to the European demo that we have today, we get the numbers that are in the right side of, of, of the slide, of course. Uh, of course, if we change the design of demo or if we change the uh, uh, um, ideas that we have for the demo these numbers will change also in fact if you apply these rules or these ideas to the demo that is being designed by china or the demo that is being designed by korea or the demo that is being designed by japan we get different numbers for these requirements of the neutron source because the requirements will be the the, the demo design thing uh, thinking is slightly different in any case, this is let's say a small detail. Uh, in it doesn't it doesn't ma it doesn't not, doesn't matter so much what are the detail numbers. The only alternative that uh, from the technology point of view it is uh, um, identified today to be able to fulfill these requirements is uh, the approach based on this uh, on neutron source based on the interaction of neutrons with a lithium target any other approach is not able to produce enough neutrons or it uh, or it requires a, a high technology risk and this gives rise to the so-called IFNIF project it means international fusion materials irradiation facility that was started in the 90s but it developed very slowly and uh, step by step uh, uh, finally came out in the last few years in europe in the so-called Donetsk project, taking into account the requirements coming from the European demo. So this is the Donetsk project. The configuration of the project is, is based on the three main ideas. First thing is that we have an accelerator, an accelerator <coughs> able to accelerate deuterons up to around 40 MeV. 40 MeV is, is okay, it's, it's something that is not uh, so difficult. I mean, we have many accelerators in the world uh, that are able to be, in which particles are being accelerated to energies, a few, um, or many orders of magnitude higher in energy, but with high current. We need around 100 or 125 milliamps, and this is very high current. This will give rise to five megawatts of power in the target and that means the uh, one of the uh, accelerators with biggest power in the world today there is no accelerator with uh, running with this uh, big power 
and only some expedition sources are becoming closer uh, to these numbers. But of course, uh, to reach this uh, uh, high power with low energies means a very high current, okay? And we need this current to get a lot of neutrons. These deuterons hit a lithium target due to the stripping reaction. This, uh, the interaction of the deuterons with the lithium produce neutrons with a spectra that is not exactly the fusion one, but is similar to the fusion one. And then it has been shown that the, it, it, we expect that the damage in the materials will be similar to the one that we will have in a fusion reactor. With these parameters hitting on a lithium target, we are able to produce 10 to 17 neutrons per second or something like this, that will allow us to generate uh, damage levels of in the, on the range of 20 to 50 dPa per year uh, in, the, in the samples, if the samples are located close to the target, okay? Uh, of course, if we put five megawatts of power in a target in a surface that is a few uh, hundred uh, square centimeters, uh, the dissipation of energy is not so easy. And then we need to take out the energy uh, using a liquid. And this, uh, the, the point here is that the, the lithium target is a liquid, is a liquid flux. And then, of course, that means that the, we need then to have a loop in which we are able to extract the heat at the same time that uh, we are generating uh, uh, the neutrons. Okay, this is the general scheme of the facility. Of course, as I mentioned before, the idea of this project, or not, not, not the Donetsk project, but the, this scheme, the idea of producing neutrons, this kind of configuration, this kind of facility, is not new. It started many years ago in different projects al along the time. In the last, let's say, 10 or 12 years, it has been developed in more detail in the so-called, in the, in the, in the so-called, uh, in the framework of the so-called broader approach agreement between Europe and, Jap and Japan in the uh, so-called ifmef veda project. EVEDA means engineering validation and engineering design activities for IFMIF. So that means that the main objective of this project was to validate the concept of this uh, of this facility, <clears throat> and to do to validate this concept, of course, at the beginning it was needed to develop a more uh, engineering detail design. But the key point of this uh, activity was to develop prototypes of the key aspects of this uh, of this concept. There were developed a number of prototypes along the time, but the, maybe the two key ones was a prototype or is a prototype of the balance of the target what we call the target facility that means the 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 target the blanket sorry not the blanket the target the lithium blanket it was built up a loop a scale 1 to 3 more or less of the loop that is the is needed and it was demonstrated without uh, deuterons it was demonstrated that we are able to control the fluid dynamics of, of this uh, component during long periods of time. And the second prototype was to build a prototype of the accelerator, of the low energy part of the accelerator, of a fraction of the accelerator that was, uh, that was built mainly in Europe and now is being commissioned. It is being installed and commissioned in Japan, in the north part uh, of Japan. The, the accelerator that we are building, it is a full current one, 125 milliamps, but uh, low energy. It does not go up to 40 MeV. It goes only to 9 MeV. So that means that, of course, this accelerator cannot be used to produce the neutrons that we need, but it can be used, it will be used, it is being used to test the, uh, the behavior of the accelerator to be sure that this accelerator can be built and we are able to manage it. I, this, as I mentioned, these are only two of the prototypes that have been built, the two more relevant, but many other validation activities have been developed in the, in the framework of this project. <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, here you can see just an example, <coughs> a few photos of the uh, uh, components of this accelerator. It is a prototype accelerator. 
It is very important. Last year, in summer last year, it was achieved a very important milestone. For the first time in the world, it was accelerated 125 milliamps of deuterons through the RFQ, because that is one of the key components of the accelerator. It is true, it, is, it was made in pulse mode, and now we are now trying to improve to reach uh, uh, higher, uh, longer times, close to continuous wave if possible. Uh, but the, the, for the moment, all the results that has been obtained up to now shows that the, uh, the design seems to be uh, feasible. The, the work on this prototyping activities is being continued in the so-called broader approach. And of course, Spain is also involved in this activity, was involved in this activity. Many of the components of this accelerator has been built by Spain. Uh, so we will be, we will continue being involved in these activities. But the, the objectives for this next phase of this broader approach activities is final confirmation of the design feasibility. We want to be sure that the, everything is okay. And later on, we will use this prototype to demonstrate, to develop operational expertise that will be used later on uh, in Donetsk. So <clears throat> the main objective of this facility is to be like a test stand for the big facility that uh, will be built uh, soon. Okay, so then if we go to Donetsk, uh, if we assume that the design is feasible, then in the last few years we have developed a much more engineering uh, design of the facility. This is a, a, a sketch <coughs> of the plant configuration. <coughs> These are the systems that are related well, the, the, the plant is, com, uh, is organized in what we call systems uh, linked to the different key components of the facility. These are the systems related with the accelerator. I will show you now some more details. Then we have the systems related with the lithium part, with the lithium target. I will show again also uh, some more details. And these are the systems related with the irradiation area. Okay. And of course, besides this, there are uh, a lot of additional systems that are very important that are all the let's say conventional systems or plant systems that are required <coughs> to fit this, uh, these other systems and <coughs> of course the remote handling one that uh, will uh, allow the management of all the irradiated components of uh, in the in the facility i will give you now some ideas on each one of these uh, uh, areas to provide you a sketch of uh, what are the things involved here <coughs> you see here a sketch of the accelerator uh, systems the accelerator is composed of uh, the injector. This is the, the source of deuterons. Then the so-called radio frequency quadrupole, that is a cavity, resonant cavity, that accelerates the particles from 100 keV up to 5 MeV. Then the so-called medium energy beam transport line that uh, takes these uh, particles, that takes this beam and shapes it properly to be included in the uh, superconducting uh, line act, that this is a set, a number of uh, accelerating cavities that uh, takes the uh, uh, 5 MeV particles and uh, accelerates up to 4 MeV. These different accelerating cavities are organized inside these cardio modules. In each cardio module we have around 8 to 10 uh, accelerating cavities. And then we have what we call the high energy transport line that takes the beam and shapes it to the uh, right shape that we want to have in the target. It, we get here a, a Gaussian beam and we want to have at the end a more or less a rectangular one. The important thing, well, this accelerator works at, well, and then we have also the all the RF system that uh, radio frequency system that feeds all the different systems to provide the energy that is required for the acceleration of the particles. All this accelerator works at 175 megahertz, uh, so this system is a, should be able to produce these microwaves. The important thing is that it is we are talking about a very high power accelerator, so we need a lot of uh, RF power. Uh, on the systems. It is the biggest RF power uh, in, in the accelerator field. 
And the, the, the challenges for this accelerator is that it must be able to run in a continuous wave. Of course, we need to have the neutrons as much as possible because otherwise we will not get neutrons. Uh, and uh, it must be able with very high uh, availability. So it will be one of the most powerful accelerators in the world, running in continuous wave, 24 hours over 25, uh, 24 hours. Uh, with high availability. It's, it, this is, these are the main challenge. And besides this, of course, some of the components that we are designing are unique in, in the world. This is why we need the results uh, coming uh, from a uh, uh, Rocasso facility. This is a sketch of the lithium systems part. The, you can see the, the deuterons came through these tubes here in the le upper left part of the slide. This is the deuterons came through here, and then the, li the lithium is flowing in this, in this component here with this uh, curved shape. In the inner part of this component, the surface of lithium is, is a free surface. So uh, uh, there is no window between the lithium and the deuteron beam, because otherwise the deuterons will be stopped there. And in order to avoid the evaporation of the lithium, then we have high velocity in this curved surface. So we have 15 meters per second on a, a, a lithium a thickness of around 25 millimeters or something like this. And then the lithium flow drops in this uh, uh, tank and then it enters in a, let's say, more or less a standard lithium flow, lithium loop. Of course, this loop will be the biggest one in the world. There is no lithium loop as big as this, as this one. The, the biggest one was the, the one that uh, we built in Rokas in uh, Japan in the framework of this Ifmifebeda project, and it was a scale more or less one to three or something like this. This loop, you can see this, uh, this is the lithium loop. Uh, of course, we need a heat exchanger to take out the power. Taking into account that, that lithium is not a very good friend of water, we need to uh, uh, put some intermediate uh, heat. Uh, um, uh, say uh, additional uh, loops and then we have a lithium oil heat exchanger we have an oil loop an additional oil loop a secondary oil loop with a oil to oil heat exchanger and then uh, an oil water loop to take out the to take out the heat there is an additional small detail that makes things uh, even more easy that is that due to the uh, interaction the nuclear reactions that take place some um, transmutation uh, products are produced are produced inside uh, the lithium like uh, uh, some tritium some beryllium some other things and besides this the lithium let's say um, corrodes a little bit the walls of the loop. Not too much, it's not a problem, but the, some impurities appear in the lithium. Um, besides this, let's say the lithium can be impurified with the air atmosphere and things like this. Uh, we know that some properties of the lithium and the interaction of the lithium with the materials are a strong fraction of the impurity contents of the lithium. For example, corrosion properties are a strong fraction, fraction sorry, a strong function of the oxygen and nitrogen content. So we need to control very carefully the impurity contents of the lithium. So we need to have a purification uh, loop in which we control the impurity contents of the lithium in an online uh, process at the same time that they are being produced. Of course, the challenge of these things are that uh, we need to run the biggest lithium loop in the world. The, we need to manage a few megawatts of power taken out from this uh, lithium and this impurity management. And of course, this all this complex must be run, must be able to run in a, a, in a continuous wave as long as possible. And uh, we, at this moment, there are many or some uncertainties in the lifetime of the of the behavior of some of these materials. Okay. 
Then we have uh, the other area, the irradiation area. Uh, in this, you can see in this sketch uh, uh, where the reactions take place. In the purple thing is the, the tubes, the accelerator tubes that uh, transport the beam. Then the lithium loop is this green component here, together with the yellow quench tank. So the lithium is, uh, is uh, moving fast here. We have the deuterium beam hitting the lithium and then the neutrons are produced. So immediately uh, close to this reaction point, we have this component that is the, what we call the irradiation module in which we locate the, the samples. The, this is a sketch of the irradiation module. This is a component of around 1.5 meters wide by 2.5 meters high or something like this. And the samples are located in this area here. The samples are located in a surface around or in a volume around uh, 20 centimeters by uh, uh, five centimeters uh, high by uh, three or four centimeters uh, depth. In this volume, we are able to put up to around 1,000 samples. And the samples are arranged in uh, packages, if you want cigarette packages of uh, around one samples. And these packages has a, a temperature control to a very high degree, uh, less than a, a few percent, to assure the temperature stability uh, along the irradiation time. And remember that we are talking about irradiation times of one, two years long. So we must be able to um, uh, guarantee or assure the temperature stability uh, with low gradients in volume and low gradients in time. This is a key requirement coming from the uh, uh, materials uh, people. Of course, um, all these things will be, due to the presence of neutrons, all these things will be heavily uh, activated. Well, during operation, there will be a lot of neutrons here. Of course, that means that this uh, this uh, irradiation must be made in a controlled environment and then all these components, all this part, all the irradiation part is located inside a concrete block, box, if you want, in which, in such a way that uh, neutrons cannot go out from this, uh, uh, from this uh, box. So the high radiation area is a relatively limited uh, volume of a few cubic meters. All outside of this box, uh, there is no, uh, we, we can walk around outside, outside of this box. Um, of course, due to this irradiation, um, uh, the, these components uh, are uh, activated and then they must be uh, remote handling. The fully remote handling is required both for the maintenance, for all the maintenance operations. The, uh, so this box can be open from the top part uh, to re replace the components that needs to be replaced uh, along the time. Of course, when the radiation is, is stopped. The, the key challenge here are related with the remote handling capability of all these things and with the long-term reliability. There is also a, a small detail that makes things also easier is that, uh, again, lithium is not a very good friend of water. So uh, for safety reasons, we have agreed that the, there is no water at all inside this box. So uh, any cooling that uh, we, we might need inside this box, that we need a lot of some cooling, of course, uh, must be made with uh, helium or other uh, tools, okay? Then just a comment on the remote handling. I have mentioned several times that we need to do remote handling. Uh, so uh, this, is, this gives you an idea. Let's say remote handling is needed in the different parts of the facility, but let's say the key area is the area. This, the key area is this area here, the, the box, the box in which all the reactions take place. So uh, this is the room that is on top of this box. The box that I was mentioned before, the concrete box is this one here. We are looking from the top. 
So this room is a big room in which uh, we have uh, some big cranes that uh, are able to open this uh, concrete box. Uh, and then the, the components can be put in different places here. And then with uh, a second crane that we have below this big one, we are able, you can see here on a sketch for this uh, second crane, uh, uh, using this second crane, we are able to take out all the different components that are located here and they can be transferred immediately to the uh, uh, room in which, the hot cell in which these components will be repaired or dismantled. The, of course, these remote handling operations are uh, unique ones. That means they are developed only for this facility and there is a lot of work to be made uh, in, this, uh, in this area. Okay, taking all these things into account, all these designs taken into account, uh, we were able to develop, we are, we are able to build a facility in which we, you can see in this figure the capabilities of this, of, of this facility. Uh, this figure gives you an idea of the volume that we have available to irradiate samples with uh, those higher than the one that is indicated in this uh, in the uh, in the x uh, axis. So this figure shows to you, for example, that uh, in in Donetsk, in in this facility, we, uh, we have a volume of around five six hundred cu uh, cubic centimeters available, in which we will have a dose. Uh, higher than 10 dPa for uh, per year of uh, irradiation. This helps us to understand uh, what are the capabilities of this facility. Of course, this volume that is available can be used to irradiate one sample or can be used to irradiate 100 samples or 1,000 samples. Uh, this depends on the irradiation experiment that we are making. But this is a summary of the uh, uh, facilities or the facility capabilities. Okay, what is the schedule that we are talking about uh, for this? Uh, this is uh, the schedule that we are um, proposing today. Of course, this is a technical schedule. It, that does not mean that there is a European decision to build the facility. It does not mean that the, this, is a, this is not a political schedule. So we can build, if we start to build it today, we will be able to have the facility running in 2030. It cannot be made faster, to be honest, or we think it cannot be made, be, be made faster. And if we start to operate the facility uh, in 2030, we will require a few years of irradiation and then a few years of analysis of the samples. So we are not able to produce a single data or we are not able to produce first data before 2035 or uh, something like this. This is only first data. Of course, we will need much more than first data. Uh, with this, we, can, we are able to show that we are in time for demo, but we are close to the critical path, okay? Um, it is true that uh, we, there is no political decision. This, this schedule is still feasible. Uh, it is true that there is still no political decision and it is very unlikely that it is made the political decision on this year. I don't think this will happen in 2020. But uh, with the, based on the different European projects that we are running, we have money coming from Eurofusion, we have money coming from the Commission, we have money coming from the Spanish government. Uh, let's say, we are starting activities, and I will say a few things more later on. We are starting these activities, uh, and this, let's say, this schedule is still feasible. So we are really starting to do things assuming like, like uh, the project is starting. Of course, okay, this is still feasible. This is a summary of the work that we have developed in the last few years. This work has been developed mainly in the framework of this Eurofusion project that I mentioned before. 
uh, based on the validation activities that were developed in the framework of uh, event activities that I mentioned, then we proposed the concept of DONES in uh, uh, 2014. It was included in the Eurofusion uh, activities, in the Eurofusion work plan. And then we have developed additional validation activities. We have discussed a lot of uh, critical technical issues and we are in fact still discussing some of them. And uh, based on all these uh, activities, we develop what we call, well, of course, we develop all the engineering things that are needed uh, or some, I, I will not say all because maybe all is a too strong word, but uh, we have tried to develop all the engineering disciplines that are needed to develop an engineering project like this. And then based on this, we produce what we call the reference design in the second half of 2016. We produce a preliminary engineering design report for a generic site in, uh, in uh, 2017. We succeed to agree at the European level that Granada will be the reference site in, uh, for the European project. Then we succeed to include the facility in the S3 roadmap in 2018. We produce a preliminary engineering design report for the Granada site uh, last year. We have also produced a preliminary safety analysis report for the licensing activities uh, at the end of the last year. And now we are in the uh, uh, starting, let's say we are discussing what we call the preparatory phase. And I will say a few words later uh, about this, but this is in summary all the discussions that need to be developed for uh, making the political decision uh, to be uh, in place. Okay, so in summary, where we are, from the design point of view, we have what we call the preliminary engineering design report. That is a summary of all the, uh, of the design that is needed for all, for all the components of the plan, all the different aspects of the plan. Our idea is that we take this preliminary engineering design report. At some moment in time, we will transfer to the project team that will be in charge of the construction of the facility. And then they will, I don't know how, okay, I'm close to the end now, eh? sorry, I talk, I talk too much. Uh, we will transfer to the, to the project team in charge of the construction and the design should be more or less completed. Of course, this thing that we call a report is not a report, it, it is, a few thousand or tens of thousands of pages. It includes everything, okay? And we, we are developing in a step-by-step -step phase. The first one was not completed and step-by-step -step we are completing in more, in, in, in more and more uh, detail. And we try to develop, a, a, to issue an, a new release more or less in a yearly phases. Where is the site? The site that has been proposed is in the south of Spain, close to Granada, in the Escuzar, uh, in a village that is called Escuzar. It is located in. Sorry, I try to go back. It is located in an industrial park that is already uh, available in this in this area here, close to Sierra Nevada. You can see this is a photo of the site. The, the, the location that we have available is more or less this one. And the site will look more or less like this when it is, uh, it is running. In theory, we are making the configuration in, of the site in such a way that uh, it can be expanded to the full if facility later on in 20 years or 30 years from now, uh, if, it is, if it is required. Uh, where we are from the implementation point of view, I, I talked just a few minutes ago about the preparatory phase. This uh, link with the fact that we succeed to include the facility in the S3 roadmap. I don't know if you are aware of what means S3 roadmap. S3 roadmap is a, a report, a planning that is made at the European level by a, a specific committee in which all the facilities that are considered strategic for the scientific um, community in Europe are identified. It, is, it, it does not provide money, 
but it provides something like a quality stamp saying that this is facility required by the uh, European scientific community. This is a very important stamp. And linked with this, it was uh, started as uh, a so-called preparatory phase in which the main objective for this is to draft an agreement for the start of the project, for the construction phase of the project. And in this framework, we are discussing all the governance, legal and financial aspects linked with this. This activity formally started in October last year. It is now running for a few months. And it will take, it is planned, it will take around two years. And you can see there the partners and observers, the people that are involved in this project, is around 11 <clears throat> European countries together with uh, Japan and uh, uh, some European organizations like Fusion for Energy and Eurofusion. And <clears throat> we, have, we have also involved some uh, uh, European scientific uh, associations. I cannot say too much. This is running and for the moment the things are going well, but of course we, we do not have a final uh, answer yet. Okay, so what is the near future? Of course we will continue uh, design work. The emphasis that uh, we are now planning is to make emphasis on the fabrication on uh, some prototypes and our target is that in the next two years maybe or three years is even to prepare draft technical specifications for the contracts that will be in the in the critical path in such a way that we will transfer to the project team even a draft technical specification does not mean that it will be the final one but it helps us to identify missing aspects in the in the design work in this year, we want to start a, what we call a project office located in Granada. This project office will be focused in integration issues, uh, requirements, uh, interfaces, CAD, and all these kind of things. We are also starting a, a detailed site, site characterization. And in fact, we are also starting, the, we want to start at the end of this year or beginning of 21, uh, the construction of some auxiliary buildings on site and you can see for example that we have started the site characterization and more detailed campaign is being prepared right now we are also starting some uh, permits the uh, requests of some permits we we are right now starting the environmental one and uh, we we are also starting the discussion with the regulatory body on the radiological licensing and it is being prepared as a Spanish legal entity that the idea is to uh, a, a public consortium that the, uh, it is being prepared a Spanish legal entity that will be involved in the project management, at least in the project management of the Spanish contribution, because Spain has committed to provide around half of the project. Uh, in any case, as I mentioned, it is assumed that the project that will be developed in an international environment with different partners. And the, the uh, legal approach is, and governance models is still not clear, is being discussed. And we have some ideas today, but the, they are not uh, enough consolidated to make any uh, agreement for the moment. And similarly with the financial contribution, we are discussing the possible contribution coming from different people. It's clear that there will be, or probably there will be a contribution from Fusion for Energy, but uh, we are, uh, there is a commitment to be a contribution from Spain. There is a commitment for a contribution from Croatia because it's our partner in many of these activities. And we are now discussing the contributions that can came from other countries. Okay, so this is just the last, well, not, it is not the last one, but close to the last one. In summary, this is a, a summary of what I have uh, hopefully explained. Uh, from my point of view, materials with emphasis in irradiation efforts is one of the key pending issues that need to be developed uh, for the development of fusion as an energy source. Without the proper materials uh, package and the proper characterization of the materials, fusion will not be possible.
Europe has a clear uh, materials strategy, specifically materials irradiation strategy that is based on intensive fission reactor irradiations to be validated by fusion-like irradiations to be made in a, a fusion-like neutron source. Donetsk is the uh, European fusion-like neutron source and it is proposed that it should be implemented in, in the near future in Granada. It is based, sorry, it is based in a high current accelerator, neutron accelerator fitting in a lithium target. Uh, we have today a quite detailed engineering uh, design uh, fully available. And as, I, as a final comment, I would say that from my point of view, the project is progressing today properly. I would, I would like to make it faster, but you know, th these kind of things are not so easy to make it faster. It is now gaining momentum, international consensus and technical readiness. And we hope that the final start of the project, the formal start of the project, can be made at the end of the year or beginning of the next one. I would not like to finish without mentioning that uh, at the end of the next year, in October 21, it will be held the uh, International Conference on Fusion Reactor Materials. This is our reference conference for the study of uh, behavioral materials uh, in, uh, for this application. It will be made in Granada, uh, organized by us. And uh, I think that the, it would be a good opportunity both for companies and also for uh, uh, researchers to be involved on this and I hope we will be able to talk a lot about Donetsk in this conference and, and that's all. I just want to again to emphasize that uh, we have a newsletter you can subscribe to the newsletter about Donetsk issues here and there is also a web page and a Twitter that you can uh, follow uh, if you are interested on what is going on in the, in the project. Sorry I told too much but um, it is difficult to make it shorter. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Joan, you are mute. Oh, no, no, you yes, are right. Thank you. So thank you very much for this exciting uh, presentation. I think that all of us are, are, are looking for the websites to buy some fly tickets to go to Granada. So that's, that's really amazing uh, what, what is being done inside the fusion community. So Thank you again for the presentation and for sharing all, all this knowledge. So obviously many, many questions have arised. So uh, we have, uh, we still have around 15 minutes uh, and we will try to match if, uh, some, some of the questions that the audience have addressed. So uh, I would like to introduce some of the questions that for instance, now which are the sectors that uh, you consider uh, that from companies, from the research centers, from the academia should fill uh, the existing gaps no? that, that you have also addressed in the, in the presentation by adding on value and knowledge. No? Obviously, there are a lot of uh, international and national stakeholders that are fully prepared to be engaged after the preparatory phase. No? So uh, it could be interesting uh, to address how should they uh, be uh, present in the operation and exploitation stages of the project. No? So maybe uh, which should be the path no? for the companies or institutions uh, to be part of this exciting uh, uh, project and to enter into, into the fusion community if, if some of them uh, have not done yet, which is how, how to begin to grow at that point. Well, it is, it is not easy to answer uh, in too much detail. I mean, I must say that all this work has not been developed only by scientific community. There are a lot of companies um, in different sectors that has been involved in the project in the last 15 years, I would say, because all the, uh, as I mentioned, Spain had a very relevant contribution in the broader approach in the IMIFEBEDA, and this was developed mainly with the Spanish companies. And I don't want to, I can mention a few of them, but I, I don't think it is worth it. But Indra, Betesa, um, um, no, I don't, okay. I, I don't want to mention all elite. I mean, there are a lot of companies that has been involved on this along the years. Uh, of course, 
we still do not know um, how will be the setting uh, between the different country contributions. So uh, if the setting is made in one way or another, things will be different. So it is difficult to predict uh, today what happens. But the, there are, in any case, from my point of view, the for a company that uh, wants to be involved in, in this uh, topic, uh, one of the key areas in which uh, we need to think about is the operation phase. I mean, maybe when we are talking about the construction phase, uh, it will there will be an in-kind contribution from some country. I don't know, maybe France contribute with the uh, cryo modules or with something of the accelerator. Um, but uh, once that this component is here, we will need to commission it, we will need to operate it, we will need to repair from time to time, we will need to change components from time to time. So I think that for the Spanish companies, the key aspects are the commissioning phase and the operation phase. I don't think that the, uh, uh, the French company will go to Granada all the weeks or all the months to make small repairs. This will not happen. This will uh, uh, this must be made by small companies or closer companies uh, to the site. Of course, this is very general terms. Besides this, of course, there are also some areas that are not properly covered today at the European level, or that there are not too many companies available. And in general, I, in generally speaking, I would say that in the uh, lithium technologies part in all the aspects related with lithium technologies we need to find more or we need to involve more institutes or even more companies uh, in this topic there are a lack of uh, expertise on this most of the expertise was developed in the past in japan and in fact also the expertise the japanese expertise it's not so easily available but because people are moving to different things. So there is not too much expertise on this. We are trying to develop it, but there is room to improve a lot uh, on this area. And uh, besides this, again, there are a lot of things to be made in the control area. For example, we are not even able to specify or to understand what are all the needs that we, we that will happen because this will realize, we will realize uh, in uh, in uh, is a the one is a little uh, relatively earlier in the in the in the project. But uh, let's say I I suggest that if someone is interested, it is easier to be in contact with me or with you, and we can arrange some specific meetings in which we discuss specific aspects. It's very difficult to go into the details. I, I usually have all the weeks or uh, very frequently meetings with one company or, or another. The only thing that I can say is that uh, you must be interested and to be interested means that you must be able to invest, not a huge amount of money, but you must be able to invest some money or some efforts, better than money, some efforts before getting big contracts because big contracts will came later in, in time. Yeah, at, at that point, uh, uh, would you face if uh, there is uh, any kind of open proposals or, or tendering for participation at, uh, for the donors project? Well, of course, of course, yes, there will be. Uh, in yes. fact, there are. I mean, we are now planning uh, some uh, contracts that will be issued uh, in the near future for specific activities. I mean, uh, I hope very soon because you you know administrative process takes very long always but i hope we will get we will make a we will issue a call for the site characterization very soon uh, we will issue i hope also a call for the construction of some buildings very soon uh, we will issue a call for engineering work uh, very soon and i mean this will came continuously in the near future or in the in the long future what I cannot tell to you now, because this is very difficult to foresee, we do not have the team, I don't know who will manage the project, how this will be organized at the Spanish level, at the international level, and in the specific countries. I mean, if there is an in-kind contribution from Hungary, I do not know how the Hungarian people will manage from the administrative point of view, 
I know how I want to manage from the technical point of view, but uh, it does not mean that it will be managed with a kind of contract or another one. This, this will be more clear later. Meanwhile, we can we can face more technical questions, no? While, yeah. while it is it is open, so let me let me introduce a little bit uh, some of the more related questions. That, for instance, the Donest is, is the European approach for material research for fusion. But are there any other projects around the world trying to validate materials for demo? Would you comment on them and their approaches? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I mean, all the all the countries that has a serious fusion program, they are fully aware that they need something similar. Well, they are fully aware they need a, a, the qualification of the materials. Um, the only thing is that there are no projects so much developed. Uh, like Donetsk. I mean, uh, uh, Japan is fully aware that they need something like this, like Donetsk. They call it AFNS, Advanced Neutron Source. The Japanese problem is that uh, it's not so clear when the budget will be available. And this is why we are trying to convince them to join our project in one way or another. Korea is fully aware. And in fact, we are also talking with them to see if they are interested in joining the project. They are fully aware, but again, I mean, the main problem in other countries is that ITER is taking all the efforts. You know, uh, the cost of ITER makes that it's very difficult to find money in, uh, in the fusion programs to be involved in new projects. The good thing in our case, or the difference in our case, is that we succeed to convince the Spanish government that it is worthy to get money from other sources that is not the fusion program to be involved in this project. And based on this, we are making a lot of, um, a lot of uh, pressure, let's say, on other countries at the European level. But uh, if we must pay this with the fusion budget, it will not be possible because all the fusion budget is going to it. So there are, of course, other ideas, but none of them are as developed as this one. In any case, I am convinced that sooner or later, this uh, there will be similar things to Donetsk everywhere, well, let's say everywhere, at least in Japan, in China, and uh, maybe in Korea, for sure. Otherwise, there is no fusion program in these countries. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes, uh, indeed. So it, it, is, it is clear that uh, administrative and technical questions not always go hand by hand, but uh, we should try to do our best, no? And uh, coming back to the, um, to the material feasibility, um, what would happen if Doris uh, is not able to validate the suitable material for a fusion power plant? So does it mean that the lifetime of the demo and the power plant would be reduced? Of course. I mean, if there is no material able to go up to 50 dPa, that means we can work only up to 20 or we can work only up to 10 or we can work only up to 5. So that means that we need to replace these components more frequently and then the, the, uh, the availability of the plant will be reduced, full stop. Yeah, but is there any estimation, for instance, for the 20 dPa per year uh, for the lifetime of for reactor? Uh, well, maybe uh, there is something, but I do not know. I mean, this is this is very difficult to say today because uh, I mean we do not have a design for demo. I mean e even we do not know how we are going to do the remote handling of demo. It is just to give you an idea: the replacement of all the blanket components of ITER or the blanket comp or the diverter components of ITER takes some years. It takes one year, two years, three years. So if you need to replace all the blanket components of demo in a yearly basis. If we assume 20 dPa per year, if you must replace all the blankets each in a yearly basis and it takes one or two years to replace, you can make a calculation on how will be the efficiency yes. availability. So let's say the materials lifetime, or better, the components lifetime together with the remote handling uh, um, let's say time that is required is is are key parameters for this. 
Yeah, in that sense, do you consider or do you feel that it would be possible to take profit from ITER and JET previous work for the remote handling facilities? For the remote, um, well, yes, we can take profit in the sense that we know that the remote handling approach being used in ITER and the one of JET is not useful at all. We need to find a completely different approach. And this is clear today. We know that the remote handling approach of ITER is not feasible for them all. Okay. Well, uh, uh, we should face the, la the, the, the last part of the, of the really interesting but talk. This is, this is <laughs> another topic. You know, telling me so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It should, it should open another, another longer discussion. So it is, it is quite and uh, really interesting. So. It is a pity that we are lack of time, but I would like to, to face uh, some final questions also, trying to, to cover a little bit uh, common in interest from the audience. So, uh, well, uh, you have uh, mentioned uh, the, real, the, the real importance of the material uh, feasibility, but uh, do you consider that uh, is there any kind of interest or there is interest or any initiative to develop uh, numerical modeling also using molecular dynamics to of simulate, course. validate, obviously validate of course. in this of area? Of course, of course. I mean, uh, how I can say, uh, in any case, we need the tools to be able to compare different radiation conditions. I mean, uh, it is not, uh, it is not, um, I mean, we, we cannot rely only on the data coming from the, uh, say, mechanical engineering experiments. We need to develop the tools that allow us to, uh, to extrapolate from different irradiation conditions and to predict the behavior of the materials. Uh, this facility, it is also planned that this facility will be a key facility for the validation of this of the codes that needs to be developed. Uh, the only thing that is that, of course, we are still okay. I would not say far away, but uh, we are far away from being able to predict the behavior of real materials on uh, ir real irradiation conditions. It, it is a is a key development. It needs to be made, but uh, it is not so easy. But let's say the modeling needs that we have is are not only related um, with the um, prediction of radiation effects on materials we also need modeling capabilities related with uh, the control of the facility related with the uh, evaluation the beam dynamics of the accelerator we need uh, to be able to predict the fluid dynamics behavior of the lithium we need to, to be able to predict uh, uh, to use this, uh, some modeling capabilities to understand the, let's say, the impurities behavior inside the lithium. I mean, there are, I would say, not hundreds, but there are a lot of, let's say, modeling needs around this facility because, again, it is a unique thing. There is no other reference facility like this. So we will need, of course, we need to build it, we need to operate it, but we will need also to understand the results that are coming from the operation of this facility in such a way that we can improve, let's say, this, this operation uh, regime. So uh, there are many different type of uh, modeling capabilities that, uh, that are needed. Yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed uh, we are really committed to help on that, no? Uh, inside the fusion community, trying to understand the multi-physics coupling, no? how, yeah. how different uh, phenomena interact and, and which is the scalability of, of the reactions. So unfortunately, we should uh, begin to close uh, the, even though it is quite interesting and I think that all of us would, would last for more minutes. So maybe I can, I can I, first of all, I would like to apologize the, 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 the prepared question from the audience that will not be answered today, but uh, please, uh, if you have some of them, uh, send us an email. We will try to, to interact with you and further elaborate uh, the answers and, and questions, suggestions that you may have uh, from the Donors Project or 
Yes, I mean, if there are questions that cannot be answered now, uh, please send to me or to Joanne and I, we will try to uh, answer um, by mail at some moment. Yes, for sure. Thank you, Dr. Ibarra. So let's, let's do the last. I think that uh, it is, uh, I, I, will, I have chosen a, a technical uh, question. So uh, if we have understood uh, well uh, the samples in Donetsk no, will be at temperatures over 200 Celsius degrees. However, a part of the reactor system no, will be at cryogenic conditions or harsh conditions such as the cabling of the magnets. No? So do you think is, it is not necessary to test the yeah, you have more or less answered before, but it has the control materials and steels and superconductors. Uh, and if well, you can enlarge for two minutes, uh, I would like also to, to have uh, or to know your impression about the, which are the, the segments or the, at the European level, the R&D situation, which is your vision uh, towards boosting the, the fusion community that all of us are taking part. Okay, on this technical question, I mean, uh, let's say usually we think that the, the, let's say the magnets is, are not so critical from the radiation point of view because you, usually we assume that they are properly sealed. I mean, uh, in general, if there is neutrons, we will have problems in the magnets even at much lower uh, dose, of course. So in, in principle, the magnets should be sealed in, enough in such a way that they do not get too, uh, too much uh, neutrons. But uh, of, of course, maybe at some moment in time, some tests uh, need to, besides this, I would say, also if some neutrons reach the magnets, the spectra, the energy spectra of these neutrons will be uh, thermalized because there will be a lot of shielding in between. So in principle, if we are talking about magnets, this test, if needed, can be made also in fission reactors. So when we talk about fusion like neutrons, we usually need, uh, uh, we are talking about materials that are close to the first wall, the blankets, diverter, and these kind of things. Of course, um, these are the key ones, but uh, with the time, I'm sure there will be more and more materials that will be appear as uh, uh, required to be radiated. And we are planning that the facility should be flexible enough in such a way that not only fusion, key fusion experiments can be developed, but other, also other type of uh, experiments, more basic experiments can be developed. And in fact, we have planned some areas in the facility to develop other type of experiments that could be more uh, basic physics ones, medical ones, or uh, uh, nuclear physics, other kind of things can be also developed uh, in the facility. On, on the other aspect, how I see the, the situation in the fusion uh, research area, I would prefer to answer in a few months from now when we know the budget that we have available at the European level. You know that this is, a, let's say, we are today in a key moment. It depends if we get the money that is needed for either or not. And uh, uh, one day we get good news, it seems that it is okay. The next day we got uh, bad news, it, it seems there is not enough money. So we, I, I do not know, frankly speaking. In any case, one thing that I'm for sure, I'm sure about this, is that we need much more people. There is a lack. Clearly, there is a lack of uh, human resources. There is a lack of young people in the in the area. So, for sure, we need to promote uh, that uh, students, uh, PhD students, postdocs, came in this area because there will be a lot of new needs. But I want to emphasize also that this is not only in the plasma physics area. Plasma physics is okay. They need people. But we need people in a lot of engineering, or I would say what we call technology part. But I can tell you that in the technology part, there is a lot of physics. All the material science needs to be strongly improved. There is a lot of things to be developed in control. There is a lot of things to be developed in remote handling. There is a lot of things to be developed in uh, 
uh, more conventional engineering uh, things. And we need a lot of people in these areas because this will be the key in safety, for example. This will be the key areas that will require a, a much more strong development in the next uh, few years because demo will be much more than if a, a, a physics machine will be an engineering machine. Okay, so thank you very much. I think that I, I absolutely agree. That, uh, <laughs> all of us uh, are committed to, to do so. We are trying to, to engage as much as possible uh, uh, students from uh, highly, highly skilled students, uh, also the community to, to take part of this, of this adventure. So uh, going to close the session, I would like to thank you uh, first First of all, you, Dr. Ibarra, so it has been really nice to, to hear your talk and, and uh, the opportunities that arise from the, from the Donors Project in the next coming future, hopefully. And then I would like also to, to give a really huge thank also to, to the audience uh, because it demonstrates that there, there is a high interest and it also uh, brings some energy you know, to, to us uh, uh, as the Fusion Cat uh, community, not, not only the Fusion Cat community, but also as uh, independent institutions. So, uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you, and, uh, and let's, we will keep you posted in the future okay. if uh, upcoming, upcoming talks are, are prepared, that's for sure we will do so because we are already motivated at that point. So thank you very much and, okay. and I'm going thank to... Thank you again very much to all of you for this time. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, thanks to all of you. Bye.